So I'll tell you what, it's it's five after. We got about uh, twelve in so far. Um, why don't I go ahead and do my little spiel about uh, about the Q and A and what have you, and then I'll I'll uh, hand it over to Sudan. Great. Okay. All right. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Darren Johnson. I'm the IEEE Point of Ventura Section Secretary. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we start. Uh, everybody in the audience is currently muted to, to uh, reduce background noise when the speaker's speaking. Uh, but there will be a Q&A at the end. Uh, alternatively, if you have any questions that you think of uh, before that, uh, you can use the Q&A box to ask your questions. Uh, the Q&A box uh, you should find in the lower right part of your WebEx window. Um, if it asks you who to send the question to, go ahead and select all panelists, and then that way I can uh, either answer it if it's some technical question for WebEx or I'll uh, uh, arrange it for the speaker. Uh, that is about all the housekeeping I've got. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to Sutan. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, hi, my name is um, Rangarajan Sudarsanan, short name is Sudan. I am the Photonic Society chapter um, chairperson or uh, acting chairperson right now. Um, so some of you are familiar with the uh, Photonics chapters, I've not been very um, active for a while, but now it looks like we will be back on track and uh, we should be able to have regular meetings uh, now onwards. Uh, today I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Daniel Renner um, for this evening. He's the first speaker for the this year, uh, as I understand. Uh, so he'll be talking about life at a startup, fascinating challenges and opportunities. Um, regarding his background, um, Dr. Rainer got his PhD from University of Cambridge in optoelectronics. Um, that was a long time ago. Not many people knew optoelectronics, what it is all about. And uh, I think he's one of the few early people who got PhDs in optoelectronics area, uh, which is the intersection of optics and electronics. And it has several names now. Photonics is also uh, as an, another name for optoelectronics. And uh, so he's been uh, in many industries for many years, uh, both big industries as well as small industries. Um, I think his experience in small industries is what is going to talk about it today, uh, life at a startup. Uh, he has been a regular member writing columns on IEEE Photonic Society newsletter. Uh, actually, I think last year he wrote a couple of articles on about challenges in uh, startup companies in photonics industries, especially. So without any further ado, I'll let uh, Dr. Renner present his presentation. Thank you, uh, Sudan, and uh, thanks to the IEEE Photonic Society for the invitation to make this presentation today. Uh, we will be talking about the challenges and opportunities of living the startup life, uh, which is uh, dear and uh, close to my heart. Uh, as Sudan uh, mentioned, my name is Daniel Renner. I'm uh, the Chief uh, Business Development Officer at Freedom Photonics uh, in Santa Barbara. And uh, what we will be doing today is basically looking at what are the skills, uh, the challenges, uh, the opportunities of working in a team in a startup environment, managing programs, uh, doing sales and marketing, manufacturing in a startup environment, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, basically uh, uh, diving not too deep, <laughs> but to the extent that we can in an hour, uh, into the various things that are needed to make a startup successful, in addition to the technical area, of course. Needless to say, in a startup, whether it's just beginning or it's been running for a year or two, uh, being very good at the particular technology that we are trying to apply is fundamental, needless to say, uh, that's a given. But there are a number of other areas, like the ones I mentioned, uh, being able to work in a team, program management, and so on, uh, that are also key. Uh, you need it all, 
to, su to succeed in a, in a startup, you need to dominate the technology, but you also need to know about all of these other skills. And there are tremendous challenges there as well. Uh, in order to learn about this, uh, what I've decided to do is to basically take my own work experience uh, as uh, the subject of exploration, as it were. Uh, I know myself better than any other person. So it's, it's somebody that I know very closely myself. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what I've done uh, in, in business. As uh, Sudan mentioned, uh, and as you can see from my gray beard, I, I've been around uh, for a while. Uh, I've been in photonics, uh, as Sudan mentioned before, it was called photonics. Uh, and so uh, what I'll do is I'll dissect, if you want, my own experience. I'm trying to extract from that some of the things that I've learned. And then with those lessons, trying to go back and see how they apply to the particular situation of a startup. Now, I have worked, as Sudan mentioned, both in large initially and then small companies. So naturally I've learned things in large companies too. So from the point of view of lessons learned, as you'll see, I've learned some things in large companies, some things in small companies, but then we'll apply it all to the startup environment. So uh, since uh, we're dissecting, or I am dissecting my own life, uh, let's start from the beginning. So I'm originally from South America, uh, from actually somewhere around here, sort of the northern portion of Patagonia. So Patagonia is sort of this triangle here, inverted triangle, uh, split between Chile and Argentina. And uh, this is a photo of myself, um, age about four or so, um, in, in this area, roughly sort of where the tip of that, that arrow is. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard about Patagonia, actually, these days there is a, a lot of marketing relevance about it. Obviously, it's a brand name, uh, so people recognize that. Before that brand existed, I, 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 it was never very clear to people when I said that I was from Patagonia that they knew where it was. Now, now it's different. Uh, people know uh, where that is. And uh, it's uh, some of the southernmost populated areas in the world. Actually, and for example, an interesting fact is if you were to leave the western shore of Patagonia, say from the Chilean side of Patagonia and go at that latitude around the world, uh, you would not hit any land until you come back around the world to the Argentinian side of Patagonia. So there's no more land any further south than that. And uh, it's fairly large. It's about the size of California, Arizona, uh, Nevada and New Mexico all combined. And in that area, there are about uh, 2 million people or so. So it's not dense at all. It's sparsely populated. So it's very open land, as you can see in uh, the background behind uh, myself in my horse there. Uh, and so in a way, sort of thinking about it, uh, I, I think that that actually was relevant and was important in my decisions of going into high tech. In a way, I sort of was used to open fields, uh, geographical fields, if you want. And I decided to continue that uh, going into an open field that was sort of just being born up to electronics or photonics at that time. So uh, this is where everything started for me. And then, as I say, when I was about uh, in my early 20s, uh, I changed the open spaces of uh, sort of geography for the open spaces of, uh, of high tech. And this here basically shows my trajectory and sort of it's a global trajectory. I am also a product of globalization in a sense, I've benefited from globalization. Uh, as pointed out, I started my life in, in Patagonia and in this town called Valdivia, in, which is where I pointed out earlier. I went to Santiago, which is the capital of Chile, to study, do my uh, 
uh, engineering first degree. And from there, uh, I went to Cambridge uh, where I did my PhD. And then I worked for a few years in, uh, in a company in England. And from there, I came to the United States, which is something that happened 36 years ago. Uh, first to Texas and then to California, where I've been, you'll see, we'll go into this in, in a little bit of detail. Um, and uh, right now, I am, in, as I mentioned, in, in Santa Barbara. So if you look at where have I worked or where I have, I have studied, starting from university, as pointed out, I, I, I got my first degree from the University of Chile, then my PhD at the University of Cambridge. And from there, I went to um, standard telecommunication labs in England, uh, which was at the time a subsidiary of ITT. Uh, this is a company that was very well known at the time. I'm talking uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, it's pretty much uh, non-existent uh, right now. Uh, then I, when I came to the United States, I worked for Rockwell International, uh, Collins Transmission Systems Division in uh, Richardson, which is sort of the Dallas area. And uh, so I worked for sort of two large companies, if you want, ITT and Rockwell. And from there, I went to small companies. I joined Ortel Corporation, which then subsequently grew into being a larger company. But at the time I joined, it was a small company of about 30 people or so. And uh, then I discovered the beauty of working in uh, small companies and uh, I've stayed on that ever since. And after Hortel, I worked for Agility Communications here in Santa Barbara, then Aerials Photonics, also in the area in Ventura. And uh, now I'm working at uh, Freedom Photonics, uh, where I've been for the last uh, nine and a half years. Uh, Freedom Photonics is uh, doing very well and uh, still obviously very much alive and kicking and uh, so are uh, the University of Chile and the University of Cambridge. The University of Cambridge has been around and kicking for about 800 years, so <laughs> no problem there. But actually, uh, every single company in between uh, doesn't exist anymore. Not my fault, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Uh, but I mention this because it's a reflection of the dynamic nature of high tech and in particular of photonics high tech companies merge one acquires another some explode some implode uh, the scene is always changing and what I've discovered this is one of these discoveries is that that is the nature of the beast, that, that is the nature of working in, uh, in photonics. And that is okay. It is the way that the industry grows and expands and uh, new ideas are pursued. And within all of these sort of background changes, uh, it's always been okay for me and it will be okay for you. Uh, so long as you understand that this is the nature of the industry, and what you are, what you are contributing is of value, and uh, it doesn't matter if companies merge or or disappear. What you are contributing uh, is of value now. Uh, it will be of value in the future, and you can pursue a career uh, that is constantly growing, irrespective of, to some extent, of what the background is doing. So, uh, as mentioned, the first place where I worked was uh, STL, Standard Telecommunication Laboratories in, in England. Uh, this shows a, a picture of how that looked like uh, at the time I worked there. Actually, STL is uh, a landmark in photonics and in fiber optics in general, because that's a place where Charles Keogh, uh, who you might know as one of the fathers of fiber optics. He was one of the people that did experiments initially on transmission of uh, information through fiber. Uh, this was sort of in the mid 60s. Uh, that actually precedes me. I'm, I'm old, but not that old. Um, and so at the time I joined STL, it already had a reputation uh, for being a good place uh, to work uh, in diode lasers, fiber optics, and, and so on and so forth. And I really was very lucky 
uh, and with my timing of uh, joining uh, SDL, uh, and it was a very good place, uh, and a lot of interesting things were done. Uh, I was lucky, as I said, because that was a time where the decision was made to install, to develop, and then lay under the ocean. The first fiber optic uh, underwater, underwater cable system uh, across the Atlantic, TAT-8. And I joined SDL in 1980 and, uh, for this period, 1980 to 85. And actually, this is a time when the fiber optic, the underwater, fi the first fi underwater fiber optic cable system was developed. It was actually uh, taken into operation in 1988. Uh, and uh, I was then, as I say, very lucky to be part of the team, being a member of the team that developed uh, the diode lasers uh, that went into a part of that eight. Actually, there was a, 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 an additional complication in, in laying out that eight, which was entirely political. Uh, the transatlantic, the first fiber optic transatlantic cable obviously uh, departed from the shores of the United States. But in Europe, there was a big battle on whether it should land uh, in Britain or in France. And at the end, there was a very Solomonic decision uh, that it would land in both. So there was a wide junction uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, splitting one part towards Britain and one towards France. And uh, AT&T Western Electric worked on the part from the United States to that wide junction in the Atlantic. Uh, Alcatel worked uh, in uh, on the part that went from the middle of the Atlantic to France. And the company that I joined, Standard Telephone, uh, worked on the portion from the middle of the Atlantic to, uh, to Britain. So that was our responsibility. Our team developed the lasers that went into that leg. And, uh, as a matter of coincidence, uh, I was actually back in, in, in England about five years ago, and I heard that this was shortly after actually the, the cable was recovered. Actually, as I mentioned, uh, the cable started operating in 1988, and it was supposed to uh, be designed to operate for 25 years, but it was recovered after about 20 or 22 years, something like that. And it was not because of a failure, it was uh, just because it became so obsolete after 22 years that the amount of traffic that it could carry uh, was relatively meaningless. So they recovered it. And a portion of TAT-8, uh, which is this, what I show here on the right-hand side of this picture, is in display at the Science Museum uh, in London. And here it's myself looking at this piece and uh, reflecting on this sort of uh, what does it mean that uh, uh, something that you have been related to that the team you worked with uh, developed is now in a museum what does that mean and i came to the conclusion that the only meaning that it has is that i'm darn old <laughs> that is pretty much it so uh, as i say i i was lucky that uh, i could participate in in, in this team i i learned a lot and as mentioned, uh, that eight was uh, deployed in 1988. And uh, initially, actually, uh, they decided very wisely to do an early test. Uh, it was not deployed right away, but it was a test around the Canary Islands uh, in, in 1985. And uh, this was a very wise, uh, uh, reason, uh, wise decision to make because actually the cable failed. And after recovery and trying to figure out why it failed, it was found out that it failed because shark teeth were found buried in, in the cable. Uh, this is a true story. <laughs> Sounds like something I invented, but it's true. Uh, to this day, it's not really very clear why that happened because, I mean, obviously, as you know, now there are underwater cables everywhere. Uh, and that, that hasn't happened again, but uh, because of this failure, uh, the decision was made to reinforce uh, the cables in a, in a different 
way so that they wouldn't be affected even if a shark uh, would bite on them. So this early test was uh, obviously something that was very critical and luckily it happened. And actually, as it turns out, uh, the Canary Islands have a long history of uh, early testing because uh, Christopher Columbus actually, uh, when he said sail about 500 years before that from a place uh, on the Atlantic coast of uh, Southern Spain, he didn't go straight west uh, towards Asia, which is where he thought he was going, but actually he headed first to the Canary Islands uh, to test his ship. And as it happens, uh, basically his main ship, the Santa Maria, uh, broke its rudder. So he limped into the Canary Islands, uh, repaired the rudder, rudder and uh, checked the rudders, I guess, of all the other ship. And from there he went straight west and the rest, obviously it's history. And maybe history would have been very different if he hadn't done that early testing. So early testing actually, because we were developing such novel things actually at the time, uh, we were actually the lasers we developed were transmitted at the wavelength of 1.3 micron. And uh, th th this was all very new um, at that time gallium arsenide based lasers uh, emitting at 0.85 micron or so were relatively common, but indium phosphide based lasers emitting at longer wavelengths were uh, new. So everything was absolutely new and reliability was, uh, uh, was very important. As I say, we had to design the whole system to sort of be down there for 25 years. And we definitely didn't want that the cable would fail because some of our diodes failed. So um, early reliability stress uh, was a big thing. As soon as some, we had some diode lasers that performed reasonably well, uh, they would go into reliability stress uh, testing. Uh, the same with, for example, our group was laser welding in, in, in the optoelectronic and the photonic industry is commonplace right now. But our group was the first one to implement actually laser welding in, in packaging. So same thing with the packages, uh, stress testing and so on and so forth. Early testing uh, was uh, very important. So this leads us to the first lesson. Uh, the lesson number one here is that high risk, difficult pro problems should be tested as early as possible, ridiculously early. If you can think of a simple experiment, uh, the simpler the better that can tell you something about the nature of what you're doing, uh, that is invaluable. Obviously, a lot of these things can be modeled. The models are very important. I don't want to diminish that. Uh, but there are always some known unknowns, some very nonlinear unknown unknowns that it's hard to find through modeling because modeling obviously is based on things that you know. And the best way of uncovering that is um, through early testing. So something that you should have in mind uh, when you're in developing products of this nature. Uh, this is actually the team that, um, uh, part of the team actually, I think there were three or four people that were missing on this day, but it's, it's most of the team uh, that uh, that worked on developing this laser. Actually, I'm here, second row, on third person from the left, uh, the guy with the beard. I've had a beard for a long time. It wasn't gray at the time. The reason I'm uh, showing this is that working in a, in industrial development, and this is whether it's a startup or a large company, but particularly if it's a startup, it's team effort. It is never entirely yourself. Uh, it, it is operating in a team that clicks together. And this team particularly clean, clicked together. And in fact, uh, we have had a few reunions uh, uh, in the years after we worked together. And uh, in the last one, which is again about five years ago or something like that, uh, the, the, we asked ourselves this question, why, why do we think that we were successful? And 
the unanimous decision was that one of the key elements was that we could work very well together, that besides being colleagues, actually we were all friends as well. Uh, we had a social life together. I mean, you obviously don't need to be friends with everyone, but uh, somehow or other, we were a collection of friends. We uh, invited uh, each other to each other home and uh, our kids played together and so on and so forth. We were a small community and that is very important. So lesson number two is that industrial R&D or industrial product development is teamwork. You just, obviously it's, this is an obvious truth. You cannot develop a photonic product entirely by yourself. So industrial R&D is more analogous to in sports, a basketball or a football team, playing in a, in a football team or a basketball team than being a golfer or a tennis player. So there's very little space for a prima donna. Uh, you need to be able to operate as a team. Lesson number three, and uh, this one I think also, as I mentioned, is crucial based on what I just told you and what makes a su successful team. You should work with people that you like. And to foster this culture is very important. It is actually the responsibility of the team leadership. And this is particularly important in a startup that you create an environment, a work environment, where people can creatively enjoy their working hours, where, as I say, there is a community. There is no fear. Uh, I mean, only the fear to the outside world, the common fear uh, to, towards nature and the comp competitors, but not internal fear. Uh, because that is the only way then that you can communicate openly and truthfully, which is, again, a key ingredient. You, you will only understand what your position is with regards to the problem that you're solving and with regards to competitors, if what you're observing, what everybody's observing can be communicated and analyzed internally in an open and, uh, and truthful manner. Um, and from a personal point of view, um, the co-workers that you're working with, uh, you might be with them for a long time maybe most of your life. And if it is not in your current job, it's amazing how these things turn and uh, you might move to another job and hey, they come and work with you later on. Uh, that's happened to me many times where uh, people that I have worked in some role or another, uh, 10 years later, I'm working with them again. So knowing them as people uh, is important, not only from the point of view of the team performance, but also it's nice. So uh, from STL, as I mentioned, I uh, went to Rockwell in uh, the Dallas area. And again, uh, I was very lucky uh, because uh, that was a time, I'm talking now the, the mid eighties, uh, when uh, uh, AT&T uh, was sort of dismem dismembered as it were. Um, at and was basically dominated uh, telecommunications in this country. And uh, it had a manufacturing arm, Western Electric. So by and large, what at and needed, uh, it was developed and then it was purchased from Western Electric. There was a very close connection and basically Western Electric belonged to at and uh, And so most of the equipment that was used in communications in the US at the time uh, was used by the at and 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 developed by and, and fabricated by Western Electric. Uh, at and was divided into, you might have heard of this, the Bell Operating Companies, and uh, that opened up uh, opportunity for competition, uh, not only from the point of view of the operators, people that operated communication systems, but also from the point of view of uh, communication system manufacturers. And this opportunity was exploited, if you want, particularly well by Rockwell Collins. Uh, Rockwell Collins had a strong reputation in, in radio, uh, starting with uh, radios for aircraft, but then going into microwave radio uh, before fiber optics. Uh, most of the communications, long distance communications, were was through radio. And Rockwell dominated that particular area of equipment. And uh, 
So once it became clear the writing was in the wall that uh, fiber optics uh, would replace microwave radio, uh, Rockwell Collins embarked in the risky business of basically getting into fiber optic to continue being a dominant player there. Uh, and supported by the fact that, as I mentioned, the, the communication network scheme had changed at the time. So that opened up the opportunity for Rockwell Collins to enter the fiber optic uh, market. And after a few years, the United States fiber optic uh, landline communications equipment supply, long haul communications, was essentially one third Western Electric, the old sort of dominant force, one third Rockwell Collins. Rockwell managed to build to be equal to Western Electric, and one third for all of the rest of the participants. So, uh, again, luck, I arrived to Rockwell at that particular time when the opportunity was growing. And I came to Rockwell with a mission of developing, again, lasers and, uh, and photodiodes to support uh, the Rockwell uh, fiber optic system business. And uh, here, uh, Rockwell, as I said, became uh, sort of equal to Western Electric, but this was on the shoulders of a lot of good work. Uh, and uh, here I have uh, sort of news from the time, this is May 1987, basically saying that MCI, which one of the operators that again, utilized this opportunity of the breakup of AT&T to become a large operator, and they predominantly bought from Rockwell, that MCI installs the first uh, fiber optic system capable of transmission above one gigabit. So Rockwell, the team, again, I, I participated from the point of view of uh, providing components uh, into um, providing the first uh, uh, communication landline, long haul communication system transmitting above uh, one gigabit. This was a very large team that did this. I, I mentioned the team that developed the diode lasers uh, for the underwater system were 30 people, but obviously the people that were working on the underwater system were hundreds of people. The same here, the number of people working on the gigabit system were hundreds. And again, the number of people that were working on the diode lasers were 25 to 30 people or, or thereabouts. And uh, what's uh, very interesting is sometimes what drives the need for this, I mean, why is it that suddenly MCI and all these companies needed uh, a system that could transmit above one gigabit. The first deployment actually uh, was driven by the QVC shopping network. So uh, shopping on TV, as it were, sort of uh, shopping through the TV network was something that had become popular at the time. And the traffic, uh, the orders going to the shopping network were so large that actually they alone were requiring at that time one gigabit per second. That was the first customer for MCI. That was the first deployment of this system. So uh, sometimes uh, what drives these things is uh, are things that you can never imagine. Uh, but what tells you is that it is important to keep close to what the customer needs are, uh, close uh, to what's driving the actual need. And so lesson number four is that a talented and charged up team on a mission can beat the incumbent dog, which is basically uh, what we did at Rockwell uh, coming up, as I say, with this particular system. Uh, actually, the mantra was uh, beat Western Electric. And to do this, uh, you need to surround yourself with the best talent that you can find. Good people, that's all. Basically, good people make a big difference. Uh, and uh, these good people need to have the target objectives, i.e. the mission, crystal clear, and it's amazing uh, what can happen, uh, which I've experienced many times, this being one example. At Rockwell, I had a dual, apparently contradictory role. 
On the one hand, as I mentioned, uh, my role was to develop and manufacture the electronic or photonic components to support the systems. At the same time, uh, my role was to evaluate and select external suppliers of optoelectronic components. In fact, we became large customers of Hitachi and Fujitsu at the time. Uh, and at the beginning, when um, I, I was told that this is what I had to do, uh, my first reaction was never in the world, I'm going to make everything. But uh, very quickly, uh, I realized that in practice, in reality, uh, my role was, these two roles were not contradictory. They were not two roles. I had only one role. And my role was to provide Rockwell with components of appropriate performance and cost for existing a new system, whether we made it internally or we purchased them from the outside. And this is basically because it, it really, you cannot do it all. Uh, it is enough if you do what makes you distinguish yourself from the competition. But for things that they don't make you distinguish yourself in any particular domain, that's okay to buy from the outside world or you don't really need to sort of waste effort in a way if you want in doing that. So as it happened, for example, in the one gigabit system that was first deployed, we used photodiodes that were made internally by us, uh, but we used DFBs that were made by external suppliers. Over time, later on, uh, we actually started using DFBs made internally as well, uh, when we could provide a differentiating factor, we could provide better performance and thus it made sense. It, it made sense to develop those and then it made sense to, to use those. Uh, so, lesson number five, uh, it is important that you should have very clear who cares about your product, i.e. who is the customer and what is their need. Uh, you are developing products that provide value, solve problems. So, having a clear understanding, like in the case of the shopping network, for example, uh, whose problem and what problem are you solving, it, it, it is very important, particularly for a startup. And this is related to lesson number six, which is something that startups are, it's a trap, if you want, that startups are particularly prone to fall on, which is, it is really dangerous to fall in love with the technology and lose sight of the business, uh, which relates to this example that I was mentioning to you, that my first instinct was, I'm going to develop everything. I, I, I know the technology and I love the technology, I'll do everything. but that is not necessarily the best business decision. And so you should really be in love with both, if you want to be the technology of the business and make sure that then you are in love with the business of transforming technology into products that provide value. That is the function of a business. You are not developing technology per se, you see, there are other places that, are, that, that do that, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but that is not really the role of business. Uh, we are, our role is to provide value to help society. And doing that through transforming technology, appropriate technology to accomplish that goal. And the value that a certain product provides to society is measured very clear by its profit. If the, what you're doing does not provide value, then you're going to lose money. Uh, that's regrettable, but the, the market is, is, is very sharp in telling you whether you're providing value or not. And as I say, be very aware that you cannot do it all. It is okay to buy some of the technology to maximize uh, your product value. The Lesson number seven is also that it is very difficult to develop a leading edge photonic product. It takes a lot of effort. So again, you cannot do it all. Be very careful about where you're spending your effort because it's difficult. Um, Hero results, which is a lot of startups uh, come, not all of them, but it is my case, I have a PhD, a lot of PhDs 
are at the initiation of the startup and in a PhD, in PhD studies, you are trained in a way to go after hero results, which I think, I mean, I, I have a lot of issues with PhD training, but anyway, one of them is that that is fine. I mean, you, you, you do need hero results. That is where things start. That is the first step. Uh, but once you're in industrial development, once you're in business, the problem is not only the first step, <laughs> that is a problem, but the problem is to make not only one then, but make a thousand, make 10,000, make a million in some instances. And making consistently many thousands or millions of components is as difficult, or I would say a lot more difficult than making the first one. So that is something that actually is not necessarily in the DNA of people that are coming out of a PhD program. Uh, so that's, and I'm talking about my own experience. That's something that I, I learned the hard way. So these are some of the things I've learned while I work in these two large companies. Then comes my life actually in startups, which as I said, I worked at Hortel, Agility, Arius, and then now in Freedom Photonics. And this shows some of the products uh, that were developing these companies where again, I had the luck uh, to participate in. Uh, or tell uh, the claim to fame, as some of you might be aware, is uh, in RF over fiber, analog transmission, uh, particularly cable TV. Uh, that was sort of the big breakthrough at Ortel. Uh, the technology had been developed, but it was in a way technology looking for a problem to solve, and the problem came, uh, fortunately, with um, the need to improve uh, the reliability of cable TV systems that were very prone to failure by using COX. So uh, this item here on the top right is actually a long haul cable TV transmitter operating at 1550 to communicate central offices. Uh, the item on the left is an antenna remoting system. So in many instances, antennas are quite far from sort of the central office could be up on the top of a mountain and the place where the signals are sort of processed is at the bottom of the mountain. And so this is the uh, the system the system designed to do that. It's actually so-called, it was called System 8000. And uh, sometimes marketing has really funny ideas on how to name things. It was called System 8000 because number eight uh, in some cultures is a lucky number. So 8,000 was better than system number eight or 80. So that's how it came up, um, marketing wisdom. Uh, then I went to Agility and Agility's claim to fame was uh, tunable lasers. And uh, uh, we developed some of the early tunable lasers uh, around year 2000. It was using technology that came out of the University of California in Santa Barbara. Uh, and then uh, areas, um, uh, basically uh, high power uh, vertical cavity lasers and uh, uh, SWIR, Indium Value Mars and Photodiodes. So these are two of the products here on, on the left side is actually a very tiny illuminator. Uh, this is the size, it's, it's like a TO can. So this is an illuminator that actually was developed uh, to fly in miniature UAVs to illuminate a scene uh, as a miniature UAV flies above, so very tiny. Uh, the item on the right is more or less same scale, and it's a pointer, uh, same thing, or similar thing. And then at Freedom Photonics, we have uh, several families of uh, lasers and photodiodes. Uh, on the left here, uh, we have a uh, high bandwidth photodiode. We make photodiodes um, with bandwidth all the way from about 20 gigahertz to over 100 gigahertz, and also capable of handling high power. Uh, lasers, we make tunable lasers at very centered at various uh, wavelengths for sensing and communication uh, purposes. Uh, we also make high power lasers, both VFBs and uh, Fabry Perals, again, for a number of applications. And we make some uh, subsystems, uh, like the one shown here, which is 
taking our tunable laser and applying the right uh, drivers to it such that it scans over uh, a number of wavelengths. It's uh, swept source uh, automatically. You can control it such that it will automatically uh, scan uh, over a number of wavelengths. Uh, some of the things that happened while I've been in a, in a startup uh, in Hortel, in for example, the System 8000 uh, that I first mentioned was initially developed actually for deployment. The first one of these links was to be ready for the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer in Norway in 1994. So needless to say, if we're going to have a link, and there was a similar situation there, the antenna was on top of the mountain, uh, the signals obviously were collected at the bottom of the mountain, they needed to go and connect this. And if you're going to provide this link to for the Olympics, there's no way you can be late, <laughs> needless to say. Um, the Olympics are not going to be postponed because our link uh, was not ready. So, uh, I don't know, it was a mixture of uh, ambition and stupidity, I think, to agree that uh, we would have this ready. Uh, we started working on it about eight months uh, before it was supposed to be delivered, so it was a crash uh, program. The opportunity was then, and either we made it or not, and uh, either we made it or not was not an option. So uh, we had a crash program, and actually we worked very, very hard. And in fact, as a reflection of that, I mean, the final system test was done in consecutive 36 hours of day and night testing the test people and myself included. So we, we, we spent uh, 36 hours going for the final test and the system uh, was delivered in time and uh, it was successfully deployed and uh, people saw the Olympics uh, with no problem. So lesson number eight is that building a company requires a lot of hard work. It is not easy, particularly in a startup where you have to wear many hats, uh, long hours, difficult decision. There, there is a lot of, not a lot, but some pain involved, but it's more than compensated by the rewards that happen at many levels, the friendships that you develop going through these tough times, uh, the ability to be able to help and provide something that is unique, that is the first in the world or uh, provides a unique uh, capability is unparalleled. Uh, it, it really beats uh, and uh, justifies, more than justifies uh, all of the difficulties involved. A few words uh, about funding a, a startup which is very important. Uh, there is a whole spectrum of how to fund uh, a startup, but essentially there are three categories. Uh, one of them is bootstrapping the, the company. Hortel, for example, was bootstrapped in the initial years. What this means is that you only rely on your own sales, whether it's programs and products, uh, and your own resources to build up. So there is no external funding. Uh, you get a customer, whether it's somebody that provides you money to develop something, a program or, or, or a product, and from the profit, you build up. And that's how Hortel started, and many other companies start like that, of course. Uh, to do this uh, in a small company, the SBIR program is, is a very important source of funding. Uh, I would say that um, uh, in my experience, uh, the SBIR program is, is really a, a key ingredient in helping small businesses, startup grow uh, in this country. Uh, or tell them change as you grow, you need more money and uh, it, it changed such that it received funding from a group of private investors, so-called angel investors uh, and related companies. So angel investors and, and such, that's the second group. First, bootstrapping is a method, having some friends that help you, having uh, some friendly investors that help you is the, is the second method. And Hortel added this investment, never losing control. So uh, a portion of the company was sold to these investors, but it was a minority. The third uh, method is, um, venture capital capital investment or larger infusion of capital that you can 
uh, through bootstrapping or, or through private investment. Agility Communications, for example, was venture capital funded. Um, Aereos, for example, was bootstrapped all the way until it was acquired by FLIR. And Freedom is, to this day, bootstrap funded. So there is nothing wrong or na na nothing particularly favorable for one situation or another. It depends on what you want to do. In, in general, if you want to bootstrap or, or have sort of small investors investing in your company, the amount of money involved obviously is smaller in general. So it takes longer, but you're independent. You keep your independence. Longer time, but you don't lose control. For situations where there's a large influx of funding like venture capital funding and such, obviously you can go, to, go a lot faster. You focus on a certain area and you go very fast in that domain that has advantages. But control can be an issue. So again, there is no virtue or nothing wrong with one or the other, just what you want. And then lesson number nine is obviously the key thing. And right at the beginning, you need to learn how to raise funds and you need to learn how to watch the financials. Money, needless to say, as the song says, makes the world go round. And it's the lifeblood of the company. Actually, a whole of the good idea that you have might not materialize for you, might materialize for somebody else. Uh, if you do not understand the financial aspects of operating and working in a startup company. And this is another peeve that I have in general with PhD programs or university education in general in engineering is that by and large, this is changing. Actually, it's changed since I went through university and there is some more sort of financial education uh, nowadays, uh, but uh, I, I had to learn it all by myself. And I think most people do. It's obviously possible, nothing totally wrong with that, but I, I would actually, I would have preferred if some of this actually would have been taught uh, in the school programs where I went through. And lesson number 10 is the startup, as I said, and we emphasize it has to create value. Uh, your own value, for example, is a direct function of your own reputation. What is it that you have done with your know-how? And similarly, a company's value is what it has done, products or services, depending on if you're in a product area or a service area, uh, with your know-how, which is your intellectual property. So one of the things that you need to do, obviously, is to protect the company's IP because you have to protect it as if it was gold, because actually it is gold. And with that IP, you have to create value, which uh, in a company, in business is easily measured, is measured as profit. And it's a very simple equation. This is the only equation that we will go through today, but it's a deceptively simple equation. And that is because price and cost are not related whatsoever. Uh, some people say, hey, well, it will cost me a dollar, I'll sell it for two, so okay, I'll have a profit. Well, give it a try. Uh, Cost and price are determined by totally different drivers. Price is primarily, as you know, um, determined by the market and by the product features that you're able, the unique product features that you're able to design that will make it attractive to the market. And then your ability to deliver, your ability to sell, and so on and so forth. The cost drivers are determined by things like how de well designed your product is for manufacturing, the ability of you to manufacture, things like your ability to purchase. Are you purchasing your supplies at the lowest possible cost? So if you look at this list and this, you can see that there are totally different parameters. They're relatively unrelated. And so you have to learn how to operate in both domains, the cost domain and the price domain to provide value. So this is how far we'll go into the lessons learned. And now very quickly, we'll see how this 10 lessons apply to a startup, the challenges and opportunities in a startup. Uh, this here shows a startup functional structure, structure in general. And not only a startup, actually, this is a structure of almost any company. Uh, you have a group, uh, a company that is in high tech, whether it's a startup or not. 
uh, you have a group that is developing technology, and you also need a group that is developing market know-how. And these together, the inputs from these two uh, define the product, uh, which then you develop, and eventually you transfer to manufacturing, and you sell, and goes out of your door. And you have then a number of support functions that support the people involved here, support from a financial uh, perspective. As I said, uh, financing is is key. That's the, the blood of lifeblood of the company. The problem is that no startup starts like this. Most startups tend to start like this. As I said, typically not always. Again, don't want to generalize, but many times it's a group of young engineers, which is great, and we have our totally convinced that they have a technology that has tremendous potential and they have a vague idea on uh, what product this can be applied to. And this is a perfectly good starting point. And from here, though, you have to go to understanding the market. As I said, at the beginning, understanding the technology, needless to say, is very important. But you need to have an understanding of all the other parameters, the market, the, what affects the people that are working in your company, what affects the finances, so that together then you can, the vague idea can be transformed into a more solid idea. And from there, you go into product development once you've developed the technology and your market research has produced what, what you need. Uh, you get into product development. Once the product has been developed, you set up manufacturing and sales, and then you have this full structure. So in a way, in a startup, you're building the airplane if you want while you're flying. And that is part of the, of the challenge. So to do this, you need a plan. You need a business plan. But I've seen many business plans that actually say, for example, that in three years, you'll be selling 310,031 devices, very precisely. Uh, I, I, I always look at this very skeptical. I mean, how do I know that in three years or whatever, they're going to be selling this on? I, I don't know where I'm going to be in three years. How do they know that? So at least from my perspective, and I think it is perfectly okay to have a plan that becomes a little more vague as you look further out into the future. That is okay, but still you need a plan, even if it's vague in what you're going to do in two or three or four years. This perspective, okay, you need to build the airplane. How does this airplane look like? Even though you might not know exactly how, how it is when right at the point you start, is okay. What you need to have a very good understanding though is what is your first step and how taking that first step gets you into a virtuous spiral going up. So that step will create more opportunity uh, that then will take you further up and further up. That is, in my opinion, what a starting a startup business plan needs to look like. Uh, it's okay not to be able to predict the future three, four, five years ago uh, uh, forward, but still you need a, a vague view of what that's going to look. And having said that it is okay that you have a vague view. Uh, you need to have a crystal clear view of the short term. So there is this ambiguity. You have to have the short term, the first step, crystal clear, and then it can be become less so as you go out. And what is short term? I'm saying 12 months. This depends on the case, can be a little shorter, can be a little longer. And you need to follow this up with execution, 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 so that you are successful at the first step which takes you into this virtuous spiral and then takes you to the second step and the third and you can build the whole company. And I have here at the bottom what lessons this is based on. And I'm not going to go into those details, but I think that this is being taped in a video. So if possible in the future, uh, you can get back to this and look at what this is. Or I'm very happy if you have any questions at the end of this or later you can contact me and we can go into further details on how all of this is done. Another important thing is that, and I, hear, I have one more minute. Another important thing is that the photonics business is fundamentally hardware business. And as such, manufacturing is key. 
Uh, the game is to make stuff. And that is what brings value to the society, building stuff. And it is what brings value to your company. If you are able to manufacture, that has tremendous value to you as a company. And uh, I couldn't emphasize that more. So be prepared to work hard and smart wearing many, many hats. Uh, it'll be a tough work, tough job ahead, but you will learn a lot. You will learn about things that um, perhaps kind of are not in your uh, set of skills right now regarding finance, budgeting, a lot of other stuff. And above everything else, have fun. Enjoy the life that this gives you a full, integrate your work into life. Uh, follow these very simple common sense rules, and I am sure that it will be very rewarding to you. So focus on creating value to society and work into understanding the factors that I just mentioned. And above and everything else, pursue happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eder, and I, I think uh, Darren will take it over. It was a very um, example. I really enjoyed your talk here. A lot of things, since I am also an entrepreneur, I understand and I appreciate all your comments and um, lessons learned. Thank you for With the that, opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I see that Jerry Knotts joined, and he is uh, the chair of our uh, Life Member Affiliate Group. But Jerry, if you're on, did you want to say, uh, have an announcement or two? Yeah, turn me on. You're on. Okay, hey, Daniel, that was outstanding. Oh, thank you very much. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Of was I've done 400 startups that are out of my mind. I wish I had that, that list. And what I liked about it is how you tied it into the real stuff. You know, we talk to the entrepreneurs right now. We talk in generality. We can't put our fingers on something they can bite into. You did. That was exceptional. I appreciate it. I wish there were more on this on this particular thing, but we do have a recorded, so we'll be sharing it. But uh, all I can say is I'm sorry I got in so late, but I only missed your first item, but I did get the rest of it. So, thank did you, you see me on a horse? Taking the time. I'm sorry. Did you see me mounting on a horse? No. <laughs> that was the most important. <laughs> thing. Did you see the video. Well, it's <laughs> in the recording. That'll be great. What were you doing? What were you doing there? Oh, no, it, it's just, it's when I was about four, a picture of myself, age four on a horse, just. Oh, wow, that's good. <laughs> well, see, you were an entrepreneur. You already climbed up. <laughs> no, that was All great. Right. All righty. Um, at this point, I'll go ahead and let folks, uh, let folks unmute. And uh, hopefully it will affect our noise. And. Uh, if you have any questions, you can either speak up or if you want to type them in the Q&A window, that's, that's okay as well. Uh, Daniel, this is Sudan. I have a question for you. Um, one of the key things I'm uh, uh, beginning to understand I want to ask you is, uh, you can develop the product once it is developed. How does the transition to manufacturing um, uh, experience you had and what are the lessons you learned from transitioning a product into manufacturing? That is a very good question because it's very difficult. <laughs> Everything is difficult, but it's particularly difficult. <laughs> and to be entirely honest, I mean, you say, okay, development, manufacturing, like there are two separate boxes. Life is not like that. Uh, in entire, to be entirely honest, I, I don't think I've ever so sort of been in a situation where, okay, development is finished, uh, let's start manufacturing. Uh, there is always uh, a graded transition, and I think you need to be prepared to do that. Um, there is a need for continuing engineering support through the transition. Uh, so. I would say that one of the important things to do is to ensure that there is enough overlap 
between manufacturing and, and engineering. So when you start, maybe it's mostly engineering with a little bit of manufacturing involved, just kind of to figure out what's coming. And then as it builds up, there needs to be more manufacturing involvement so that uh, they can prepare for what's coming. And then once you call it, okay, well, now we're in manufacturing, but it's very blurry. I mean, there's no definite transition. It's just that now it continues, but hopefully the amount of engineering involved starts decreasing, but it requires engineering support to through the birth, as it were. And uh, then if things are going well, then you'll see that engineering support decreases and it's replaced by manufacturing engineering. There's always a need for engineering support, but so design engineering decreases and manufacturing engineering continues. Uh, so I think you need to plan for that. I mean, that's a reality of life. Plan for a gradual transition. Thank you very much. I had a question. Uh, how would, would, oh, there's echoing. That is why it was not very clear. So how would, your uh, ideas apply to software startups? Very good question. And as I mentioned, fortunately or unfortunately, my experience is with hardware. Um, I have never developed a software product. So um, the short answer is I cannot give you a an informed opinion on that. Uh, but I would guess that some of the principles still apply in the sense like, and again, here I'm guessing, I've never developed a software product, things that I talked about, like early testing. Uh, and I think that's something that in software is done in the sense of releasing an alpha and then a beta. It's kind of like early testing. You, you kind of test it as uh, before releasing uh, the product. Uh, the transition from design to manufacturing, obviously, in, in software is, is, is quite different. Uh, the funding aspects for a software company that I mentioned, particularly the soft skills as it relates to people as operating in a team, uh, funding, I think I would say that all those apply intact I, in the same way. Um, so. I, I would say that probably most of these apply, but there are a few that, because of the particular nature of, of software, uh, are different uh, as opposed to hardware. Right. Um, Same with the service company, actually. <laughs> I, I just have a comment that uh, when I was in college as an undergrad, I took a course uh, that wasn't very popular. It was like, um, accounting for engineers something along those, those lines it was it was uh, i thought it was i found it very useful later on but it it wasn't one that uh, it was an option it wasn't one that very many people took so um it, one of your lessons in there i think was was very pertinent to that, that uh, to be able to understand what the finance people were saying or to in a small enough company to be the finance person is is very important uh, well, the I wish I had had the MBA. To take that course. I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, comment from Sam that he likes Zoom better than WebEx. Uh, <laughs> what, can, what can I tell you? I directly gives us WebEx. <laughs> Any other questions? Either shout or type them in. Uh, we can give it a minute if you'd like, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any uh, any activity. Like I say, go, go ahead and shout, but guys, if you like. I, I think that's uh I think that's uh I think that's it. And uh that that uh the slice with the 10 lessons, I I I think I could have used them a couple decades ago. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they're still usable. <laughs> they're, still us they're still usable, but I could have used them <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> All right. Um, if that's it for everybody, um, I want to thank you. And uh, Sivan, if you have any last uh, last comments, go for it. Otherwise, uh, that'll be it. Uh, Daniel, it was a very good talk. And as I said, Jack, I wish um, we had more such talks. And I, I know you have written articles on the finance. Uh, some of you may not uh, know that, but there are articles written by him in the Electrical Photonic Society newsletter, uh, where he describes in detail, especially the financial aspect of it. Uh, that was pretty good. That's one of the things I keep uh, reading it. Um, still, I need to learn a lot of things. Being an engineer, it is very tough to understand those concepts very easily. Um, but he has written it very simply. So if you want, um, I wish you have some time to discuss, uh, talk about the important, which is the financial aspect of uh, a company. Like we may steal them. What is that? Yeah, I mean, steal him for the other side. <laughs> Again, uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Thank Thanks you. for the invitation. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Enjoy yeah, it. Thank you. All right. Thank take you, care. Daniel. Thank you. Bye.